I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Hey Frank. Yeah. How come Noah couldn't go fishing? He only had two worms. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage him. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. There are two worlds out there. You will see your world, the natural lost world, differently through God's wisdom and see the stark distinctions between both. Yours is a natural world where God is non-existent. So before we get started, let's pray. Maruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam noten veshomerek varech lelamed leyadrichut leyanhat otanu vederek sheba aleinu lelechet heledeit perhat aneinu uzaneinu vilevno leman timsor lanu merachmatech yadiatra udvunatech veniref niflaot mitoratra sherwa hakodesh shalachat tanchet kolano el kolahemet berechat limud hamila shelecha b'shem Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the Universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. I want you to turn to John chapter 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Turn now to John 8.32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is what will open your mind to this world and the next. His word and His truth. His word will truly open your eyes to show you who you really are to yourself and before God. What this world really is and who the God of it is. God's truth is based on facts and reality from His perspective, from His world to ours. God's truth accurately represents the state of affairs of your life, of your heart, this world, and the next. God's truth opens your eyes to the spirit world, the angelic beings and creatures in the third heaven, Satan, devils, evil spirits, possessions, principalities. His truth makes clear we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God's truth opens your eyes on how to resist Him and them. God supplies you with the armor to wear against them, that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. His truth doesn't leave you defenseless. His truth equips you for this life and the next one. God's truth opens your eyes to the satanic deception falsehood and intentional distortion of information as he did in the garden. You won't die. And the sucker went for it. Satan is still at it. But knowing God's truth, Satan won't be able to lie and sucker you in. You absolutely know what the truth is. You've got the book. You've got all the answers. God's truth are statements that align with the external world and can be universally recognized as accurate. God's truth calls an ace of spades, an ace of spades. There's no softening of his message to anyone. He's not a respecter of persons. He calls it as it is. If you get offended at the book, sorry. If you get offended at my words and the words that I'm speaking are coming from the book, you take it with the author of it, not with me. Knowing this truth is the first step towards God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is your first step towards making you free. Truths are statements that once articulated and acknowledged contribute to expanding your knowledge. Knowledge are just facts and information you accumulate through various means. What you learn through your eyes, your ears, your senses. Some are useful, many are useless. A lot of the knowledge you have is useless. Now that you have this knowledge, these accumulated facts, Know how to apply them wisely in your life. Wisdom will play a crucial role on how you will use and apply this knowledge. Wisdom is the faculty of making thoughtful and informed decisions by discerning right and wrong, good and bad, understanding the consequences of your actions, thinking before doing it. It involves applying knowledge, experience, and understanding with sound judgment to navigate life effectively and make thoughtful choices. Wisdom is connected to humility, 
As a wise individual, recognize your limitations because we all have limitations. Be open to learning from others and don't let pride or your ego cloud your judgment. Be willing to admit when you are wrong and understand that you don't have all the answers. Hey Frank, I have a question. Yeah. Not everyone has wisdom. Where can we find good wisdom? It's funny you say that because Job ended up asking the same question about 3,800 years ago, about 1,800 years before Jesus Christ. Go to Job chapter 28 and verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? So that was a pretty good question he asked. And then verse 13 he says, Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. Now interesting, wisdom has a price, and it's not found in the land of the living. Verse 14, the depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it is not in me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx, or the sapphire. Now the gold of Ophir was renowned for its purity, highest quality, its rarity, and its beauty, making it highly sought after. Verse 17, the gold and crystal cannot equal it. Always speaking, comparing it to wisdom. And the exchange of it shall not be for jewels or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls. For the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it. Neither shall be valued with pure gold. Now, you have the wisdom of the world which is absolutely worthless. That you get at a dime a dozen. You get a lot of it, but in the end, it's just a waste of time. And it makes your life worse. If you're of the world and you think it's of value, check where you're at in your life. How's that working out for you? How's that helping you out with the wisdom of the world? Job already knew that worldly wisdom. He knew about it. He was on the lookout for real wisdom. So he asks again in verse 20, Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from all the eyes of the living and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death saith, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. Jump down to verse 28. And unto man he saith, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. He knew what wisdom was, but he was asking, where does it come from? Job's question that he just asked here is going to be answered 900 years later. So God through Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So Job asked the question, where does wisdom come from? And the Lord answered, from me. I give wisdom. Notice what else God adds to Job's answer. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding can be gotten from many different places. But when it's coming from God, you can't go wrong. This knowledge coming out of the mouth of God is as Noah Webster said in his second definition, it is for your learning, it is the illumination of your mind. The illumination of the mind refers to the act of enlightening or enlightening one's mind, consciousness or understanding. It implies gaining insight, clarity or understanding about a particular subject or situation. When your mind is illuminated, you have a deeper understanding of something and knowledge becomes much more clear and more apparent. God's wisdom gives you insight or revelation that brings clarity to a previous unclear or confusing concept. The illumination of the mind is often associated with increased awareness, wisdom and a broader perspective on various aspects of life. Those of you that are truly saved, you know what I'm talking about. The clarity of mind that we have. What does David say in Psalm 119? Turn with me there to verse 98. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Thy testimonies are my meditation. Look at where he's getting his information and look at where he's getting his understanding from. Verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. In this world you can have knowledge but not understanding, meaning possessing information or facts without grasping their deeper meanings or their implications. However, God provides both his knowledge and his understanding and gives you the wisdom to operate them. 
So back in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 7, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Hey Frank, I got another question. Yeah. Now that we know that wisdom comes from God, how do I get it? You'll notice what James says in chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. The word abrade from vocabulary.com means to scold, tell them off, or even to criticize. So basically, God wants you to go to Him and ask Him for the wisdom. And He won't scold you, He won't tell you off, and He won't criticize you for doing it. But there is a condition for you getting this wisdom that God gives freely to anybody who asks Him. Verse 6, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Faith is the key that moves and pleases God. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's a prerequisite. So guys, let's go back to James chapter 1 and verse 7. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Doubt is what short circuits and kills your prayers. Doubt seems to erase prayers as if you've never prayed them, or even petitioned for them. Verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The word unstable means not fixed. The second definition, not steady, inconstant, irresolute, wavering. Basically, you don't know what you want in life. There's an old Italian saying that says, A 39 gli va stretto, a 40 gli va largo. And to translate that, it means at 39 it fits tight, and at 40 it's wide. And to give it to you the American way, at seven and a half, it's too tight, but eight is way too big. So you don't know what you want. It's either too tight or it's going to be too wide for you. When you ask, be sure what you want. Be clear what you want. Don't go back and forth. The term double-minded refers to a person who is conflicted or divided in his judgment and inclination, making it difficult for them to make firm decisions or commitments. Here's what double-minded means and some examples to illustrate the concept. Double-minded means divided in judgment. A double-minded person is unsure or indecisive in their thinking and beliefs. They may waver between different opinions, perspectives, worldviews, making it challenging for them to arrive at a clear and confident understanding of truth and which to ultimately stand on. You don't know if you're coming or going. Double-minded means divided in inclination. A double-minded person is torn between competing desires, passions, or motives. They may experience conflicting emotions or inclinations leading to inconsistency in their action and behavior. Walk straight, know where you're going. This is what the Lord is saying. For example, Mary feels drawn to living a healthy, happy lifestyle but also has a strong desire to indulge in unhealthy and bad eating habits. As a result, she often finds herself torn between making healthy choices and giving in to her cravings. A double-minded person lacks commitment. Double-mindedness can lead to unwillingness or an inability to commit to a course of action or maybe to a particular belief system. This lack of commitment can result in the lack of progress or growth in various areas of your life. Either it is or it isn't. For example, Richard is hesitant to commit to a long-term commitment or relationship because he keeps second-guessing his motives, his choice, his fears, which he never addresses. He wavers from his head, knowledge, and heart's desire. As a result, he finds himself stuck in a perpetual state of indecision, unable to move forward with clarity and conviction. This lack of commitment hinders his personal growth, professional advancement, and development of meaningful relationships. Richard's double-mindedness leaves him feeling anxious and dissatisfied as he constantly wrestles with conflicting thoughts, emotions, without finding resolutions, without addressing his fears and uncertainties, he remains hesitant to embrace the opportunities that could lead to his personal fulfillment and actually his success. Ultimately, Richard's inability to make firm decisions and fully invest in his aspirations leaves him feeling unfulfilled and unsure about the direction of his life. When Richard does make a decision, he finally gets there. 
He keeps thinking back and second guessing if he made the right decision. And so, his life goes on. Another example, Mark is hesitant to commit to a long-term career path because he keeps second guessing his abilities and interests. As a result, he frequently changes jobs and fails to gain substantial experience in any specific field. You're double-minded. Double-minded, unstable behavior. Double-mindedness can lead to inconsistent behavior and lack of reliability. A person who is divided in their judgment and inclination may display erratic and unpredictable conduct, making it challenging for others to trust or even rely on them. For example, Sarah often agrees to help her friends with her projects, but ends up backing out at the last minute due to her wavering commitments. This behavior leaves her friends feeling frustrated and uncertain about relying on her. This behavior is going to cost Sarah her relationships in the end. In summary, a double-minded person is someone who struggles with internal conflicts, uncertainty and indecision in both judgments and inclinations. This internal division can lead to instability and inconsistency in various aspects of their life, affecting decision-making, behavior, commitment to a specific action and belief. When the call to the gospel is given to you, you become double-minded. You have two opinions. You're here, you're there, you're neither here, you're neither there. That's double-mindedness. The Bible warns against double-mindedness and encourages believers people to seek wisdom and a steadfast heart you know where you're going in their relationship with God and with others know what it is and just go for it ingesting God's wisdom will nourish you and make you grow spiritually your relationship between you and your God will actually deepen worldly wisdom operates from the knowledge base it possesses thus the works of a lost and natural man will produce and are driven by their flesh, their human understanding, and often focused on worldly pursuits, such as status, immediate gains or gratifications, or personal ambition, rather than considering higher moral or spiritual principles. Many work within the context of their current societal norms and values. Turn with me now to James chapter 3, we'll start reading in verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, and the word conversation meaning manners and behavior, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, the works of the flesh derived from their knowledge, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. The word entreated means easy to be obeyed, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to them that make peace. The wisdom that is from above has a different knowledge base that it's actually operating from. Thus, the works that will be produced are guided by divine insight and understanding, leading to actions that are virtuous, compassionate, and aligned with higher principles. These are the two wisdoms, the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. There are two worlds out there. You will see your world, the natural lost world, differently through God's wisdom and see the stark distinctions between both. Yours is a natural world where God is non-existent. When you start seeing the world that you're in through God's eyes, you are going to understand what God sees in the world that you're actually in. You've heard of a God, but you don't give a flip about this God. And did you know that if you have a Red Bull, you won't give a flying flip either way? Think about that one. You lead your life based on you, your world, your earthly wisdom. Your life is basically based on me, myself, and I. This is where you're coming from. I say this through experience, based on people's lives, yours, mine, because this is the way I was when I was in that world. I ended up coming out of it. I had to change my thoughts. I had to change my motives. I had to change a whole bunch of stuff to say, you know what? I don't want to be part of that because I was not a nice person when I was in that world.
That's how we are, we're just plain selfish. You live your life on your own terms because you are the belly button of your world. You are the center of your world. Everything revolves around you. This is your world. This is what God sees. Having the wisdom of God within you changes your life. It changes your perspective, your outlook on you, those around you, your world that you're actually in. Your eyes see differently through a different set of lenses. Here you see both worlds with their ultimate ends. Eventually, everyone who has developed a real relationship with the Lord their God leaves the old world for a much, much better one. They see from the cesspool that they're coming from. They see what's on the other side. Blessed is the person who sees both worlds and has a choice to which one they want to live in. Contrasted to the person who only sees and only knows one world, theirs. The natural, earthly, fleshly, carnal world. That's where they're at. That's a tragedy because you don't have a choice to say, I'd like to go to the other one. But when you come to the Lord and you ask Him of this wisdom, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you reading Scripture through His Word, all of a sudden it's going to start coming through. You're going to start understanding. You're going to start seeing what the other world is. How bad do you want it? You're feeling comfortable in your world? Have a nice life. Very short, you don't know when you're going to breathe your last. And by the way, your judgment is around the corner. And I just hope and pray for you that your name is written in Lamb's Book of Life. Because the lake of fire is a very, very long time. But when your mind has the wisdom of the world in it, you can only draw from this worldly wisdom whatever the world, your world, can offer. The world's wisdom contrasted to God's wisdom. You've got something to work with. You've got something to see side by side. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, the world's wisdom is devoid, listen to my words, devoid of the knowledge of God. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding, like we just finished reading in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. Devoid meaning entirely lacking or free from the knowledge of God. That's the world where you're coming from. And just as I said, God is non-existent in this world. And I feel bad for you people. You walk, work, think, and you have your being in this world. Think with me now. What can this world that you're in give you that's of high value? Think about that. I thought about it and I said nothing really. Because it's nothing but a heartache. Don't know where I'm going sometimes. Lord, just guide me and just take me by the hand and let's go. And this is what he's been doing for the past 38 years. And believe me, I never regretted one day. Actually, it will cost you dearly without you realizing it. And may the Lord open your eyes to it to see the world that you're actually in. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There are two worlds out there. One leads nowhere in this life and eventually you'll find yourself in the lake of fire. Think about it before you get there because when you do get there, it's going to be too late. The decisions that have to be made for heaven or hell is made right here. God does not make that decision for you. You choose heaven or you choose hell. You choose it. Don't be double-minded. Know what you want, grab the bull by the horns and just go for it. Who are your friends again? Did you think of changing a few of them? Maybe all of them? What profit do they give you? Spiritually, intellectually. What exchange do you have that makes you a better person? Maybe that's what you need. A fresh start without your cancerous friends. Maybe that's what you need. Getting rid of those people and free yourself from their influence who try to shape your mind and ideas and ways according to their own thoughts, their ways, their philosophies of life, their worldly wisdom. Who you stick around with, that's what you're going to become. What you read is what you're going to become, what you hear. If you play in the dirt, you will get dirty. If you are with certain people, that shit is going to transfer on you. That's the best way I can say it, because it's clear, precise, and to the point. Let go of their wisdom, which knows not God. Pay attention to the conversations that you are presently having with these people. Change your cancerous friends. Listen to what they're saying. Where are they guiding you? What stuff are they putting into your mind? 
and molding your mind because for you to be with them, how can two walk together except they be agreed, Amos said. If you're with some people, it's because you agreed to be with them. You're willing to let go of some stuff to say, you know what, I'm just going to be with them. I don't agree with that, but I'm going to stick around. But if you stick around long enough, what you didn't like about them, all of a sudden, it starts transferring on you without you realizing it. And that's where it's bad because you don't see it coming. How do those conversations with these cancerous friends of yours that you have, how do they leave you afterwards? Uplifted and edified? Neutral or just blah? When do you speak of God in a reverential way? with these cancerous friends? When do they encourage you to walk in a way that's pleasing to God? Uh-huh, just as I expected. Never, eh? Yeah, I think it's time to change your friends. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? He made you stupid without you realizing it. That's incredible. Only God could do that. You think you're wise having the wisdom of this world? You keep thinking that. You keep thinking that. Your wisdom is devoid of the knowledge of God. The one in whose hand your next breath is. That's what you need to remember. God made your wisdom from the world where you're from very, very foolish without you even realizing it. Verse 21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by their world's wisdom knew not God. For it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In this passage, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In particular, the Apostle Paul is emphasizing the unique and counterintuitive way that God chooses to bring salvation to those who believe in Him. He's coming in from a flank that the wise of this world don't see it coming. They see it and it says, what is that ridiculous? Let me keep going. To understand the meaning of the statement, we should consider the context of the verse. In the preceding verses, Paul addresses the Corinthian church, which was divided over various leaders and boasting of human wisdom. He contrasts human wisdom and the wisdom of God, highlighting that the message of the cross appears foolish to the world. To the wise in this world, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the most ridiculous story ever told. But it holds the power of God for salvation to all who believe. So it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Means that God chose the proclamation of the gospel, which may seem foolish and unimpressive to many of the wise of this world because they're smarter than God. Has the means to bring salvation to those who have faith in Him. It is through the simple preaching of the message of Christ's death and resurrection that people are saved and reconciled to God. Overall, the phrase emphasizes the power of the gospel message itself, regardless of the messenger's eloquence or human wisdom. God's redemptive plan works through the simple act of preaching, the message of Jesus Christ bringing salvation to those that believe in Him. Through the simple message of Christ's love and death and resurrection, the person who can humble themselves after hearing the message, the one who has divested themselves of all of their ego, their pride, their arrogance, will find God's mercy, His love, and His precious salvation. Your arrogancy, your pride, your ego, many times, all the time, it keeps you from coming to God and actually acquiring the salvation. What are you hanging on to? What arrogance do you have? What pride do you have? What ego do you have? Think about it. Where is it driving you at? May God give you the wisdom to see the end of the road that you're on. And it's not a pretty one. You're coming in at 250 miles an hour and there's a cement wall right in front of you. And that car, that vehicle is not stopping and you're making a beeline straight for it. I feel bad for you. May the Lord open your eyes on that. Romans 1.16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. With all their worldly wisdom, the natural man knows not God. From that world, they don't know God. In their wisdom, the natural wisdom, the wisdom of this world, there is no knowledge of God. Through this higher philosophical wisdom, God conceals the forgiveness that could be had by all who would believe just a simple message. Your wisdom can be keeping you away from God's grace, His mercy, and His salvation. 
Your wisdom is driving you to hell and eventually to the lake of fire. The worldly wise in all their wisdom refuses to believe in such a story and will never come to God in repentance and accept God's free gift of salvation. So in all of man's wisdoms and life philosophies, they don't know God. At your judgment, you wish you had. And if you're watching this video and for you guys in here, a judgment is coming. Either the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne. But you're going to one of them. And if you're going to the great white throne, may your name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Who are your friends? Who are your cancerous friends? Think about the friends, the people that you hang around with. I'm just asking. I'm going to stop it here. I gave you enough to wrap your head around for this week. May the Lord keep you, guide you, and keep you close to Himself. The world's getting darker. And may the Lord open your eyes. May you come to the Lord asking Him, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, help mine unbelief. Lord, take me by the hand. Guide me to you. It's a simple prayer. God, I need your help. Open my eyes. God, make me to understand who I am, who you are, what my sin is. Father, I just pray for salvation in here. And I also pray for salvation out there. In Jesus' name, Father, I ask. You have a good week. Lord willing, we'll see each other next week. So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous no, not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on his name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.